Beloved, let us pray. Creator of the universe, savior of humanity, helper of the helpless. We know that there is no church without you. No truth without you, no peace without you, no us without you. So keep our sights upon you, even and especially as we read your word and proclaim your good news this and every day. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Well, as you might have seen um, a few weeks ago in the call to worship, I just returned from travels in Seoul, South Korea, and Tokyo, Japan with my family. I had the great honor and privilege of going to the country of my parents' origin and also my cultural heritage. Jordan warned me upon going home that I would get asked the question, what was your favorite thing about your trip? And so I better be ready with an answer. And sure enough, I have received that question a dozen times and have had zero good answers. And it's not because I didn't have a great time. There just wasn't a particular memory or experience that rises to the surface for me. I just loved traveling and being reminded of how big the world is. Like right now in Seoul, South Korea, it is 2 a.m. An entire country and population of people who are worrying about their own governmental elections, dealing with their own unique histories, living their lives in their own distinct way. But I also love being reminded of how small the world is. That even though our languages sound so different, the sound of laughter is the same. How our cuisines may be different, but the necessity of the table remains the same. And even though our cultural traditions and our idea of fun may be so different, everywhere you go, no matter what country you are in, one thing remains the same. There will be Legos. <laughs> now this will likely come as a surprise to none of you, but the Danish toy company known to us as Lego was the single most successful toy company in 2023 and every year for the last decade. In terms of how many Legos are actually out there in the world, at 400 billion Lego pieces, that would be as if every single person living on the earth today owned 86 bricks. <laughs> but back in 2003, Lego was actually on the verge of bankruptcy after quickly and aggressively expanding into other lines of business like theme parks and video games and a clothing line. In response to this crisis, the toy company hired a brand new CEO with the hope that he would do something drastic to save the day. But much to their dismay at the time, their new CEO, Jürgen Nordstorp, did the opposite. In place of a bold plan, he started by asking a very basic question. What is Lego uniquely about? After interviewing customers, conducting surveys, and analyzing market research, the astonishing, groundbreaking answer that they came up with was that Lego is uniquely about interlocking modular units. <laughs> In other words, Lego is about Legos. Nutstorp concluded that the primary reason behind Lego's rapid downturn was that at some point in time, they had lost their way. They had lost sight of what they were uniquely and are uniquely about. 
Now, when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter if you are a for-profit company or a non-profit organization, if you are a toy manufacturer or the church, if you are around long enough, if you experience enough success or traction, you might be tempted into thinking that the next obvious move is to evolve, to expand, to grow. I mean, isn't the goal of success to pursue and amass a bigger following with greater influence, yielding more power? Or to use the metrics that are so often used to measure church success, church success shouldn't our goal be to increase the three Bs, buildings, budgets, and butts in pews? And yet, shockingly enough, none of those things can be found in Scripture. Yes, Jesus talks about making disciples of all nations, but he never once talks about worship attendance or membership roles. Yes, he talks about how we should give our treasures away, but never once does he lay out an investment strategy. The most practical advice we get as the church can be found in the New Testament letters to the church. In these ancient missives, we see plain as day how much the church has changed over time, but we also see how much has stayed the same, how we may be fighting over different issues, but we are still fighting. The right hand can't be in the same room as the left hand. The legs refuse to move over some disagreement they had with the feet over which shoes are the most doctrinally sound. The body of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus in the world are at a bitter standoff with themselves. And as a result, it has become frozen in place. We have become frozen in place. We have prioritized every other issue and endeavor under the sun, and as a result, we too have forgotten what we are uniquely about. We see this not just in the deepening church divisions and acrimony, but in mass departures from the church by those who still claim to be Christians. And so this entire month, we are going to take a page from Lego's book and go back to the basics. We are going to ask ourselves, what are we uniquely about? What makes us the beloved community? <laughs> Guiding us on this five-week endeavor is a single chapter in Paul's famed letter to the Romans. Now, this epistle is widely recognized as Paul's crowning achievement and the most thorough development of his theology. It is rich and complex and not easy or fun to read at all. After all, there is no apparent story or plot or any interesting characters to unpack. It's just a lot of words. But as I have said before, whenever we read a letter to the church, we are quite literally reading someone else's mail a people, to a people living in an entirely different time and place of our own, which means that plucking any verse or teaching from these letters without being aware of the context is not only irresponsible, it can be dangerous. And so we proceed with caution. In the case of Romans, Paul is reaching out to a church that he has neither visited nor helped to found. But he somehow learns that they are in big trouble. They have forgotten what they are uniquely about. From its inception, the church in Rome was diverse with Christians of both Jewish and Greek cultural heritage. But that beautiful reality changes overnight when the emperor of that time, Emperor Claudius, expels all the Jews from the city. Only after his death, when the ban was lifted, did these Jewish Christians return to their homes in Rome and to the church that they helped to build and shape only to discover that it had changed in their absence. Now, knowing this, you can almost hear the rumblings underneath the text. We were gone for just five years and this is what happens? 
I mean, ugh, the, litur the liturgy is nonsensical. The music is just grating. And the leadership, well, the leadership isn't what it used to be. I'll say that. They don't even reference the scriptures like Jesus did. They keep talking about philosophy and ethics and logic. You can't call yourself Christians. We are the real Christians. But two can play this game, of course. So you can also hear the rumblings of, yeah, you were gone for five years, and we were the ones who kept this fledgling community afloat. We were the ones who brought in all of these new people into the fold, just like Jesus told us to. We translated the gospel into a language that people can actually understand, and you people just want to keep things old and the same. You think you're the real Christians? No, we. We're the real Christians. Now you kind of get why Paul was so intense. Even the very structure of his letter points to what he was trying to do. You see, for the first 11 chapters, Paul is simply setting the groundwork for what he really wants to say. For 11 chapters, he lays out his argument in such a way that both his Jewish and Gentile readers can hear and get on board with. For 11 chapters, he takes the foundation of what they already believe to be true to convince them of something deeper and greater. Now, how does he do that? Well, first, he gathers them around a belief that they share that salvation is a gift from God. It is by grace, through faith, that you have been saved. Not by works or by righteousness, but by grace. And who exactly is in need of this grace? Well, everyone. From the Jew to the Greek, the circumcised to the uncircumcised, the men and the women and the children, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Emphasis on the word all. Now, how do we know that this grace is effective and real? Well, it's easy. Two words, Jesus Christ. Jesus, the very Son of God, the very Son of Man, in his life and his death and his resurrection, made grace real and available to all of humanity, every nation and every people. Jesus is actually the hero of this story. Jesus is the single reason that the church exists. And so after 11 pretty grueling chapters of reminding this diverse community of Jesus-loving, grace-spouting, God-worshipping Christians of what they already believe to be true, only then does Paul drop the big therefore in chapters 12 to 14. From the head to the heart. From theology to ethics. From belief to practice. That is where we pick up our passage for today. So listen up, church in Berkeley, to Paul's letter to the church in Rome, chapter 12, verses 9 through 13. Let love be genuine. Let love be genuine. I mean, even they agree, let love be genuine, sincere, authentic, non-hypocritical. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, pursue hospitality to strangers. Beloved, this is indeed the word of the Lord. By way of recap, two weeks ago, our director of youth and family ministries, Dave Carranza, set the scene by reminding us that in Jesus Christ, in this community that we call the church, we are all a part of something greater than ourselves. 
like disparate pieces making a beautiful mosaic. Our greatest offering to God and this community of faith then is our very selves, our very lives. Then last week, Pastor Mark built upon that foundation by pointing out the complexity of that mosaic, the varied nature of the body of Christ, a body where each of us has a unique yet essential role to play, none more important than the next. And because of that, we can find unity with one another, not in shared thinking, but in shared service. Now, in those eight verses that they cover, Paul sets the table in such a way that you really have no other choice but to sit down and eat the meal that he has made. And while he may use nice and pretty words like love and hope and patience, make no mistake, the dish that he is serving is not going to go down easily. Now, at first glance, it kind of looks like a laundry list of Christian to-dos. Let your love be genuine. Check. Hate what is evil. All right, check. Hold fast to what is good. Okay, check. Love one another in mutual affection. I roll, but check. <laughs> now do these things and you too can call yourself a good Christian. But as with any text, there are different ways to translate this one. And I think an alternate translation can offer us even greater insight. You see, instead of a list of 13 distinct commandments, each with weight of their own, this passage actually contains one primary commandment that all the others exist in service to. Genuine love is hating what is evil holding fast to what is good, being affectionate with one another in brotherly and sisterly love. Like its counterpart in 1 Corinthians 13, the primary commandment is love. Chapter after chapter, verse after verse, page after page, letter after letter comes down to this. Let your love be genuine. That is the mark of a true Christian. Paul doesn't say, let your love be decent and orderly, or let your love be known on TikTok or Facebook. He doesn't say, let your love mirror your cultural or even scriptural preferences. As hard as this might be for us to believe, in Romans, Paul is not wagging his finger at the divided church and saying, come on, folks, we are better than this. No, the reason that Paul spends most of his energy going on and on and on about things like grace and faith and the love of Christ is to remind us that the gospel is better than this. Paul is calling them out, yes. Paul is calling all of us out by saying, if we actually believe what we say is true, if Jesus really did save our souls and change our lives, if our whole reason for even coming to church really means something to us, then it has to show up in a real and tangible way with one another right here in the beloved community. That is Paul's big reveal, his big therefore. Genuine, radical, revolutionary, it's time to put your money where your mouth is, love. Now, I am well aware that love is the single most cliche, obvious conclusion of any and every sermon that has ever been preached since the beginning of time. You know how Mark shared last week how he wants to preach sermons that people like? Well, here's my confession. I want to preach sermons that people haven't yet heard. And I'm not the only one. The temptation is real. Which makes sense, seeing as the church has been around for a really long time. We've been doing this whole Sunday worship thing for a really long time. We have said and heard all the things for a really long time, so much so that it's kind of losing its impact, you know, its flavor, its oomph. Now, in the face of that reality, we in the church do what we think needs to be done, you know, to save the gospel. We evolve. We expand. 
We do everything in our power to grow, to grow our impact, our influence, our empire. So instead of talking about sacrifice, we talk about success. Instead of selling everything and giving it to the poor, we buy up more land for ourselves. Instead of opening wide our doors, we install some stronger locks. Instead of being genuine with our love, we put really clear conditions on it. And in doing so, the beloved community, we, the church, forget what we are uniquely about. And that's love. Genuine love. Now, why should that be our answer over other important things like truth or faith or even Jesus himself? Well, it's simple. We are called to be uniquely about love because Jesus, our Savior, was uniquely about love. And I'm not talking about some kind of ordinary, convenient love, but genuine, humble, nonsensical, doesn't make any sense in the world, changes your life and probably the world in the process kind of love. The kind of love that hates evil in all of its varied forms and isn't afraid to say so. The kind of love that clings to what is good even when the rest of the world is fixated on fear. The kind of love that is more concerned with outdoing one another in honor over just outdoing one another. The kind of love that serves instead of just receives, rejoices instead of criticizes, perseveres instead of gives up. The kind of love that gives generously, not prudently or time and budget consciously, but generously. The kind of love that says your presence in this place is more important than my preference. Now, just because love is the expected answer, that doesn't mean it's the easy one. And in the 2023 book, The Great Dechurching, De researchers found that across denominations, across political spectrum, across the country, the number one reason people leave the church is that they don't feel loved in the church. Now, you can hear that and be pretty depressed about it, but what I hear is that the number one reason people will stay in the church is if they feel loved in the church. Friends, that is why Jesus left us this broken yet beloved community. Out of all the inheritances, out of all the gifts, out of all the things that he could have given us, he gave us this, the church. That is why Paul spends so much time writing about and talking about the body of Christ. Whether we want to admit it, in the city of Berkeley in the year 2024, the reality is, is that church matters. What we do inside this building, how we conduct our worship and our ministries, how we talk to each other in committee meetings, how we greet each other at coffee hour, how we treat each other in the parking garage, all of that matters. It matters to the people who walk through our doors on a Sunday morning and tune in to worship virtually. It matters to our neighbors who sit on our corner during the week. It matters to a world full of people who are genuinely wondering if God exists and if God does, does that God love them? Now, whether we want to admit it or not, in the city of Berkeley in the year 2024, the reality is, is that the beloved community was always meant to be the most compelling witness to the gospel. We are meant to be the most compelling witness to the gospel. Yes, to the world, but also to each other. As the song goes, and they will know that we are Christians by our love. But even more than that, they will know who Jesus is by our love. And so I can think of no better embodiment of that truth than the nine precious souls who are making the decision today to join the church. Like, what? <laughs> That's crazy. Gone are the days when it is cool to join the church. 
to raise your hand and say that I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. I want to give of my time and my energy and my resources in the name of God to make the world a better place. Now, when you ask these individuals, if you get to know them and hear their stories, what gives me hope is that when you ask them why they are joining the church, their answers are not because this is an impressive place. This is a successful place. This is a place where intelligent preaching is happening and the best classes are being held. Do you want to know what they say? Is that they have felt loved here. They have felt welcome here. They have experienced the beloved community. Friends, may it continue to be so. Amen.